As a homeowner, as a do-it-yourselfer, when it comes to floor systems, you're most likely going to run into this in a couple different situations, right? You're going to have um, maybe an existing house, an existing floor, you're finishing your basement, and you have you can see the floor system above. Or you're building an addition and you need to put a floor in it, right? or uh, even a shop with like a uh, mezzanine or some type of storage area and you need to make sure that you build it sturdy enough so it's strong enough and um, so i wanted to look at um, design of a floor system and then i'll jump into some pictures on the next video uh, but i want to make sure i touch the whole design thing um, kind of in depth a little bit so that you kind of have a, a general idea on where to go and what to do and, and just general sizes on, when it comes to floor systems so there's a few different things to think about first let's talk about an existing floor system like in your basement and you've got a floor if you can go in and clean up anything that may be notched too much or too many holes put in it and you can sister what they what they call it a sistering is taking another board of the same size and just putting it right next to it and and nailing it in if you can tuck it up in or slide it through the joist bay and then flip it up so that it's uh, bearing even better um, you can get saggy floors, you can get floors that are at a level. If you've got really old houses and those floor joists have just been beat up with running new electrical wires or duct work or whatever, and they just put too many holes in them. Um, I definitely recommend that. And as an inspector, sometimes we require it for safety purposes. We get down in these old houses, and we look up and we're like, you got to do something, right? Most people will do it anyways. They'll say that, you know, this isn't going to work. This is my house. I want to fix it. And uh, so they just go in there and they sister next to as many of them as they can. They might have to pull out a few electrical wires um, to get it done, but definitely plan for it before you get into that process of rough in, right? Because once you run plumbing pipes or electrical wires, then it's a lot harder to go in and add those supports. Um, so that would kind of touch base on like an existing situation, but let's just say that you are installing an addition or, um, you know, you've got a shop that's got a big floor in it. You're like, how do I, what size do I put in? How do I know that's correct? I want to make sure that it doesn't sag. Um, there's a couple different routes you can take. One is the prescriptive mount, or method, which is through the code book. It's using dimensional lumber, two by tens, two by twelves, two by eights, um, dimensional lumber. That's what the code book talks about. Then you get into eye joists, which are like a manufactured joist, right? It looks like a, an eye, right? It's got like a particle board in the center and then, you know, the top flanges, top and bottom flanges on it. And they have like pre knockout holes for some of your penetrations that you have for electrical wires. If you go down the eye joist road, um, you can get with, um, whoever, whoever got you your, uh, is getting you your lumber package and they can design it for you right? They can decide, do you need 11 and 7 eighths? Do you need nine and a half? Uh, what size eye joist do you need? What's your span? And they will literally design the whole thing. They'll tell you what you need for beams and brackets and hangers. And if it's within your budget, you can purchase the whole package, have it delivered. If you're doing it in the prescriptive method, then you just want to make sure that you kind of follow general code requirements. And so right out the gate, the number to think about in general is 15 feet. Most floors, even with eye joists, from what I see, do not span over 15 feet. So if you've got a house that's 35 feet wide, well, and you're running your, your joists that distance, you're going to end up with a, at least one or two, uh, um, interior bearing walls, right? So that means that you probably need interior bearing footings. So when you build your, put your footings and your foundation walls in, you're going to have to think about you know, where is my floor breaking? Um, you know, obviously with like an eye joist, they can span farther than 15 because it's all design. They're going to design it and tell you. And I'm not saying you can't do that with some of these charts, but you also got to think about, well, you know, am I better off to put in like an interior bearing wall or do I want my floor joist to be like eight inches or 12 inches on center instead of 19 or 16, right? More lumber or bearing wall, you know, that like, how does all that stuff mesh together? You want to just run that through yourself and figure out what you need. Most people use two by tens and they span about 15 feet. That's what most designs are that I see. 
Um, when you get into um, new houses, if this was a brand new house that you were doing and you used um, iJoist, which is a manufactured product, the code actually requires that you drywall the underside of it. You're like, well, I'm not going to finish my basement. I'm going to do that at a later date. I don't want to install drywall because I want to be able to get up in those bays when I do finish the basement. Well, you might want to look at using dimensional lumber then because the exception is if you use like two by tens or dimensional lumber, you do not have to drywall it. And it must have something to do with fire rating and that if a fire starts, those pre-manufactured eye joists are pretty flammable and they just spreads through the house faster than if it's just a solid piece of lumber. Um, that was installed, I believe, in the 2015 code, and it's just been in there ever since. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Now, it's only in a basement situation. If it's a crawl space, it's non-living space in the crawl, well, then it doesn't matter. You can use either you want, you're not going to be required to go in there and drywall the underside of those eye joists in a crawl space. That's just in a basement situation where there could be living space down below, storage, people store in their unfinished basements, and if a fire was to start, they want to make sure it's protected. And uh, so anyways, let's look at the code and the charts here. And so you can have an idea um, when you get into design what you'd be looking for. So let's see here. So this is floor joist spans for common lumber species. And it says residential sleeping areas live load 30. So they actually have uh, different charts here. So that was for sleeping areas and it was a 30 pound live load. And then we get into here and they have living area, which is a 40 pound live load. So if you want to know you're covered, you're going to do the same thing through the whole house. You just stick with the 40 pound live load, right? Because it's a little bit more weight. The spans, you know, are going to be a little smaller. If you were only doing an addition, you add only a bedroom and you're like, I just want to save as much as I can for funds. So I don't want to have to put in extra lumber then you would probably hop over to just the sleeping area um, chart to come up with what your spans can be. So again, it depends on what type of lumber you're using. If you're down south, maybe you're using a southern pine or some other type of material. Where I'm at, we use Doug fir larch. That's and number two is uh, the usual, but you can see there are different grades in here, right? So make sure you're getting the right grade of lumber. And make sure you're looking at the chart but if i was to go to the box store and i was to go pull a two by four and go buy it most likely it's going to be number two that's just kind of what they stock um, you might have to special order number one or structural select um, but then it dives into so spacing right i i kind of told you the sweet spot was 15 feet so if i have two by tens and i'm talking about 15 feet or I'm, and I'm talking 16 inches on center with number two. Here they're going to let me go up to 17.5, right? So maybe you got that a little bit longer span. I'm at 16 inches on center. I'm okay, right? If I hop over here to maybe a, your dead load's a little more, we go off of a 10 pound dead load, but maybe your dead load's a little bit more where you're at. And so they're going to take you over here and they're going to put you right here at that 15.7. So again, that 15 foot mark, right? And uh, let's go hop over to the other. So that was 16 inches on center. Now here's the rest of this chart. So a lot of people will do the 16 or they'll do 19 too. I very rarely ever see 24 and I very rarely ever see 12 inch on center. Um, 12 inch on center is just if you really don't want to put in that interior wall and you're really close um, to get into where you need to go and they'll just say, okay, let's hop it to 12 inches just to get there. So here is 19 two. And we've got, for my area, is Doug Fur number two. And we've got number 10. And here we go, 1511. You hop over here to two by 10 at a 20 pound dead load, and it's 14.3. Again, it's just really close to that 15. Um, that was for the sleeping areas at 30 pounds. So now what happens if we go to the, let's go to this one right here. So we're talking about living area with the 40 pound. Okay, so blow this up. And you go to 16 inches on center and so we're two by tens, third column in. Doug for number two, 15 foot seven. So that's 16 inches on center in a living space with a 10 pound um, dead load. 
is 15.7. And I hop over here and I'm seeing 14.3. Now obviously if you're using different materials, you know, here's hem fur, but again, 15.2. You get into 20 pound dead load, it only takes you to 13.10. Southern pine, here they got you, at, uh, one, two, three, they got you at 14, and then you got you at 12.10. So here, pop over to here though, spruce pine fir is 15.5 and 14.1. So you can see how depending on what type of lumber you have, whether or not it's number two, whether it's number one, what the grade is, it can change what the distance is that you're allowed to span for your floor system. But everything just always seems to wrap around 15 feet, give or take a foot, right? And uh, so you can kind of take that into consideration when you're designing your project. If there is a situation where you can get to 15 foot or less in any of your spans and you don't have to put in an interior bearing wall and you can meet the requirements, um, then I would take that route, right? That's the direction I would always go. When it comes to sizing though, um, if, you go, if we go back to here to the chart, you can see that they allow two by sixes, they allow two by eights, all the way up to two by twelves. That's what the charts hold, that's what they cover. Well, you also have other components as not just structural and how sturdy the floor is, right? You don't want your floor to be bouncy, so you want to make sure you size it right. But at the same time, you have to meet maybe insulation requirements. If it's like a crawl space, you know, maybe you have to have that R30 and that R30 requires at least a 2 by 10 to fit. Um, so you might have to do 2 by 10s or 2 by 12s. Um, you also might have duct work or you might have plumbing um pipe that you want to protect with insulation you don't want it sitting down below there so maybe you're going to install maybe a taller uh, dimensional lumber a 2x10 or 2x12 typically i always see 2x10s i don't ever see them over 15 feet and they're usually that 16 to 19 inches on center so go through that when you're ready. Um, if you're doing your whole package together, hopefully you're kind of going through all these little videos and it's helping you to design all the components so you can order everything all at once. Um, but that should get you through floor design. Now what about cantilevers though? Maybe you're like, man, I got, okay, I got my floor design, but I got a, I'm on a cantilever. I want to pick up some extra square footage on my second level. Um, and I want to carry it a couple feet over. Yes, you can cantilever and there is a chart for that. So here we have cantilever spans for floor joists supporting light frame exterior bearing wall and roof only, right? So it's only supporting the wall and the roof, okay? So it would have to be like a second level or like a, sla uh, not a or like a crawl space with no second level, okay? It's just supporting the wall and the roof. And here they're asking, okay, well, what are your member spacings? So maybe we did uh, two by tens at 16 inches on center and I have a 50 pound snow load, and so I can go um, roof width. So they're actually trying to figure out, well, how much weight is going on that cantilever? They're telling you if your roof width is 24 feet or less, and you're using two by tens um, at 16 inches on center, you can have a 20 inch cantilever, okay? Uh, 30 pound snow load, which is kind of closer to where I'm at, uh, two by tens at 16 inches on center again and two by tens and you can get up to a 32 foot roof width and I can I can cantilever 18 inches if it was 24 I could go 26 inches now when you get into um, eye joists that are structurally that they're designed well they might be able to cantilever a little more so you got a lot of cantilever in your house in your addition, you might want to just shift right over to like an iJoy system. So you just get exactly what you want. They design it for you and you don't have to dive into charts on, well, can I go two feet? Um, but then I got to use this and I don't want to use this. Maybe you don't want to use uh, two by twelves. Maybe you want to use two by tens or two by eights or whatever, right? Um, it's telling you that your ratio of backspan to the cantilever um, shall be three to one, right? So if you span, you know, Two foot cantilever, it's a three to one, so then you gotta go six feet back the other way, right? So three, three to one. Um, they also talk about balconies in here. Some people will cantilever balconies. And so cantilever spans for floor joists supporting exterior balconies. Again, it gets into the member size, you know, two by tens, two by eights. What's the spacing? What's your snow load? So 30 pound or less. 
50 pound or less. So again, it's not supporting a roof. It's not supporting a wall. It's just a balcony, right? Just supporting maybe some chairs and some people to sit out there. And so uh, two by tens at 16 on center, 50 pound snow load, you can go 49 inches. That's four feet, which isn't bad if you just want to go out there and you have maybe a, something that you want to look at. Uh, maybe you have a great view and you just want to put a couple chairs for coffee in the morning or something. That's, that's a great balcony. And so you can use this chart. Now this thing tells you that you have to backspan two to one. Okay. So three to one, if it's a living space, two to one, if it's a balcony, I've seen a lot of contractors over the days, um, they will carry their joist back and maybe they hit a beam. And what they'll do is, is they'll take a joist hanger and they'll actually install it upside down. So they'll go and put it over the top and then they'll nail it off, right? So the uplift of back from the cantilever, right? If you're out on the balcony of this cantilever with weight wanting to drop down, they'll actually install uh, joist or joist hangers upside down and nail it into that beam. If that's where um, your cantilever uh, terminates, right? Is hitting a beam somewhere back into the house. So just a thought there. Um, hopefully that kind of helps you with your floor design, cantilevers, and figuring out what direction to go with how you want to design it. All right. So I'll, uh, the next video, I'm going to, I'm just going to dive into a few pictures that I found, of uh, just kind of existing situations and, um, uh, new, um, floor designs, talking about rim boards and all that kind of stuff.